Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Together with hearts of praise, the people of God say, Hallelujah. Praise King Jesus. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus today, that you are growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, and that you are becoming a better ambassador, a better representative of his while you are here in your time on earth. Well, we're going to continue our study and our very first video in this series, we discussed who Jesus is, which is a very important question. The second video, we discussed who the Holy Spirit is. Now, in the third video, I'd like to discuss what probably is the third most important aspect that we need to understand before we move on in our series to the basic elements of Christianity, things like baptism paying tithes, and other such topics that we will certainly address in the future. But today I want to discuss a topic on heaven. Because what distinguishes Christianity from most other religions, if not all other religions, is the idea that it is very exclusive. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And no man will come to the Father but through me. And in that statement, Jesus makes the road to heaven very exclusive. Now we're going to look at some other texts today that will better explain what it is that Jesus is saying. But the thing that we must understand, no matter how offensive it is to others, and remember, we're not the ones that wrote this. This is God's holy word. This is the message, the extension of love that he is offering to all mankind. But in order to make heaven our home, we have to follow God's way and not follow our own way. In Proverbs, a verse that we're going to look at later in this study, there's a verse that says, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. And what that tells us is that we can easily deceive ourselves in following our own ways, our own intellects, our own ideas, and yet by doing so, we will never make heaven our home. So as we begin this study, and hopefully you have your Bible in front of you, let's begin with Matthew, and let's look at chapter 7 and verse 13 to verse 14. Now this is interesting because Jesus is speaking here, and he says, enter ye in at the straight gate. Now that word straight in the Greek means narrow. And if you know this verse, you're going to say, well, that's the very next part of the verse. But the word narrow in the next part of the verse doesn't give us a clear picture of what Jesus is saying. So let me read the verses first, and then we'll come back and look at them. It says, enter ye in at the straight gate, or the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. That's the path that everybody seems to be traveling. That's why it's so broad. That's why it's so wide. And yet Jesus continues and says, Many are those who go in thereat. There are many traveling the broad road. Many good people in our definition of goodness. Many people who we might perceive to one day make heaven their home. But as we're going to learn, those are not the people that are going to be in heaven. Because in verse 14, straight is the gate, or again, narrow is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, or the kingdom of heaven, eternal life, and few there be that find it. Now that word narrow in the Greek, if you were to look it up, indicates trouble, distress, and affliction. So this is the way we could read that. 
enter ye in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many traveling that path. Because straight or narrow is the gate, and full of affliction, distress, and trouble is the way that leads unto life. And because of this, there are few that find it. Do you remember in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, Jesus is speaking again about the road to heaven. And in verse 26, he says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yes, even his very own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, I don't want to focus on the other aspects of that verse. What I want to talk about is that we must hate our very lives in order to be a disciple of Jesus. For Jesus continues in verse 27, it says, Whosoever does not bear his cross or hate his own life cannot come after me and therefore cannot be my disciple. And he goes on and he illustrates what it means to be a disciple and the cost that must be counted before we step into this war, before we step into this battle. Because this is a, a lifelong battle about opposing our own desires, resisting our own goals, our own dreams, our own purposes, and instead learning what it means to sacrifice the flesh on a daily basis to live lives of discipline and to forego the pleasures of this world, instead pursuing righteousness, holiness, godliness, and heavenly mindedness. You see, as I stated, most of the other, if not all of the other religions known to man here on earth indicate that the way we make our way to the kingdom of heaven is by being good. But we know the Bible tells us there's not a single good person on planet earth. All have fallen short from the glory of God. And so it's in Jesus that we place our trust and the work that he accomplished for us. That's how we make heaven our home. But if our ultimate goal is to make heaven our home and it's very exclusive and it, it's very narrow, it's very straight, it's, it's filled with difficulty, distress, and affliction as we make our way there, then it's important that we understand what the road to heaven is all about. And that there's only one road to heaven, and if you don't come on that narrow road, no matter how good a person you are, no matter how religious you are, no matter how many religious practices and traditions you follow, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look again at Matthew chapter 7. Jesus says, beginning in verse 21, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Those are the people that are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Those who are doing the will of the Father. Well, what is the will of the Father? The will of the Father is to obey his laws, his statutes, his judgment, and his commandments. And you're going to see that in verse 23. But he continues in verse 22 and he says, Many will say to me in that day when they stand before the Lord and they give account for the decisions that they've made in this life, particularly the ultimate decision, whether to follow Jesus and obey his will or to follow their own desires, their own intellects, their own preconceived conceptions and ideas, informing God into who they want him to be rather than serving him as the God that he is. Now in verse 22, he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In other words, have we not spoken your truth to all those that we know? Because that's what prophesying is. It's speaking the word of the Lord. And so they're going to say, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not told your truth and the truth of your word to others? And in your name, have we not cast out devils? And in your name, we've done many wonderful works. Now, friends, listen, this is not a description of a practicing sinner because they wouldn't make these claims. These are religious church going, so-called Christian people 
who are going to profess to have been doing the work of the Lord. And yet Jesus is going to say in verse 23, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. You knew all about me, but I never knew you. Therefore, depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now that word, or those words, work iniquity, iniquity is lawlessness. So it means you have not been obeying my laws, my statutes, my judgments, my commandments. You've been following your own heart, doing what you want to do. But as Jesus said, the road to heaven is full of sorrow, distress, and affliction. It's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us much. Many sacrifices in this life. A life that is focused upon discipline. And friends, this is where many are in error because they think as Joel Osteen and other such preachers or, or false prophets are telling them that this is your best life now. Well, friends, if this is our best life now, we might as well quit. Because if this is our best life now, what reward does heaven hold? I'm glad this isn't my best life now. I'm glad that I can look forward to the things that God has prepared for me as his child that no eye has ever seen. And even in our wildest imagination, we cannot begin to conceive. Because we have to be honest here. It's not easy to follow the law of God. It's not easy to live a life of sacrifice and self-discipline. It's not easy to forego all of our dreams, all of our desires, all of our passions, all of our pursuits, and instead to walk a thin and narrow tightrope in doing everything that we can do to be obedient to the Lord Jesus in striving to make heaven our home. Look at Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 24. Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, oftentimes when we read this, we misunderstand one key point, because at this point, I mean, they were well aware of what the cross was, because the Romans were practicing this as a, an act of torment and judgment on a daily basis. And so when they walked from one city to the next, they literally saw people hanging on a cross. And this was a reminder to them what would happen if they opposed the Roman government. And so Jesus says, take up your cross and become like these who are being punished, tortured, and crucified because this is the life that you are to exhibit as a follower of mine. For whosoever will save his life, come down from that cross, he will lose his life. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, shall find it in the life to come, in the kingdom of heaven. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world in this life, and yet lose his own soul in the life to come? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Is all the money in the world worth your soul? Is all the fame and fortune and popularity and material possessions in this world worth your soul? Many think so, friends. I trust that you don't feel that way. You see, it's important for us to understand this because there are so many that are telling us that there are many ways to the kingdom. There are many ways to the Father. doesn't matter whether you're a Buddhist or whether you're a Muslim or whether you're a Christian or whether you're a Catholic. It doesn't matter. As long as you're a good person and you do the best of your ability to follow the laws of God, then you're going to make heaven your home. But again, as I reminded you, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that decision are the ways of death. They're going to fall into the category of those we read about in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, when we're told, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, I thought I was right. I thought I had it figured out. I, I, I thought I was following your word, and yet he's going to say, I never knew you. 
you workers of iniquity. Looking back for just a moment at Matthew chapter 7, our text, which was verse 13 and 14, enter at the straight gate, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, full of affliction, distress, and trouble that leads unto life, and few there be that find it. But notice what Jesus says next after those words in verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Why? Because they're going to tell you that it's an easy route, that the road to heaven is easy. But we know as the people of God, it's not easy. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. We're told to endure hardness, to endure trouble, to endure affliction and stress in this life as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A soldier isn't sitting on the beach of, of the Bahamas and enjoying all life has to offer him. A soldier is in the pit. He's dodging bullets and grenades, and he's fighting for his very life simply to stay alive. And so Paul uses, as an example for the follower of Jesus, the word soldier because we are in a battle, friends. And our battle really isn't against this world or anything that it has to offer. Our battle is against us, the way we see the world, the way we desire the world and the things that the world offers. He says in verse 4, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please the one who chose him to be a soldier. Our focus isn't upon our best life now. Our focus is upon being a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus. And in the same book, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, look at, look at what it says, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall have their best life now. Is that what it says? Of course not. It says, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, shall endure hardship, trouble, affliction. They will place themselves daily upon the cross as a living testimony of a sacrifice unto the Lord Jesus, and by doing so, they will gain their souls, and ultimately, they will be rewarded as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So it's important we understand that there's only one way to the kingdom. Jesus told us in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. When he says, I am the way, he's saying, I am the road to heaven. I am the path to heaven. I am the truth that you are to follow. And I am the life that you are seeking. And no man will come unto the Father. No man will make heaven his home, but by me. And remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you love me, if you claim to be in a relationship with me, then you'll obey my commandments. And those commandments are given to us starting at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and ending in Revelation chapter 22, verse 21. We know the will of God. We know what we are to obey and how we are to live our lives because we study, we read the word of God. And we don't just pick and choose the things we like and that make us feel good, but we believe and trust in the whole word of God and obey the whole word of God, every single word of it, no matter what it costs us. So Jesus says, I am the only way, I am the only truth, and I am the only life. You're not going to find it in any other prophet any other great teacher, or anyone else who claims to be God. It is only through me, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived 2,000 years ago, was resurrected, and still lives today. Hallelujah. And even as we speak, friends, he is transforming lives across the earth. And his call is the same to each person. Lay down your life. Pick up your cross. Be ready count the cost, suffer affliction, hardship, and distress, and follow me in all my ways. 
Do you remember in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So the only way we're ever going to make our way to the kingdom, the only way we're ever going to see the Father is through the person of the Lord Jesus and all that it requires to be a follower of Jesus. Now, in understanding this and believing this, many times people are going to call us narrow-minded. But we are narrow-minded. Jesus said narrow is the way that leads to life. And so obviously we're narrow-minded because we understand the way is not vast. It's not open to all. It's not traveled by many. It's not the easy way. It's not the popular way. It's not the accepted way. It's the narrow way. And so when they tell you that you're narrow-minded, you may simply want to reply, you have no idea how narrow-minded I really am. And the more we follow Jesus and the further down the path we travel, the more narrow we become in all of our ways, all of our thoughts, all of our deeds. Because as I stated earlier, it's not easy to abandon all your hopes. It's not easy to abandon all your dreams, all your goals. But in Luke chapter 13, verse 24, Jesus is stating the same thing according to the words of Luke. And Jesus says in verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Why? Because that word strive there in the Greek indicates agonizing. And we, as the followers of the Lord Jesus, are agonizing to enter into the kingdom of God. We are fighting such a difficult battle that it's bringing great agony. And Jesus says this is what it's going to take. So strive with great agony to enter in at the straight gate, the narrow gate, the gate that very few choose to travel. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, but they shall not be able. The reason they're not able is because they cannot live such a life of discipline and sacrifice that is required as a follower of the Lord Jesus. Now, I know that this isn't a popular message. I know that this will empty the pews. I know that this will cause many to be angry. But again, these aren't my words. These are the words of the Lord Jesus, Almighty God himself. And so we either choose to rebel against them or to surrender to them. And it is my prayer today, friend, that you will choose to surrender to them. And in doing so, not only for yourself, but you will take a stand upon truth to all those that you meet. And you will not allow them to deceive themselves in thinking that there is a way that seems right to them, yet when they stand before the Lord on judgment day, they discover they've deceived themselves and they're never going to enter in. Let us do everything we can do through love and patience and gentleness and kindness, but firmness. Let us stand upon the word of God and proclaim the truth that Jesus is the only way, and no one shall ever enter into the kingdom of heaven but through him and the work that he accomplished on Calvary some 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah, friends. God has made a way for people to come back into a covenanted relationship with him. But it's not by doing things our way. It's by doing things God's way. And we learn God's way by reading and studying and applying his word on a daily basis. Well, friends, I truly love you. I'm so thankful that again you were with us. I hope that this wasn't confusing. I hope it was clear and concise. I understand that there's a lot of meat here. And sometimes it's difficult to fully grasp and understand what it is the Bible has been trying to say to us. But it is my hope and desire that the Holy Spirit has spoken through this, the truth of God's word into your life, and that you will understand how serious a matter this is because believing in Jesus is not enough. Admiring the person, the work, and the life of Jesus 
is not enough. We must enter the gate. And in doing so, we must count the cost, understanding what it's going to cost us to be a follower of the Lord Jesus. Do you remember in James chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, you believe that there is one God. And you think by doing so, you do well. But the devils believe, and they tremble under that belief. So obviously, believing with no action is not good enough. There must be an action on our part where we enter the gate and we begin to strive with great agony to be faithful followers of the Lord Jesus. That's why Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, Paul says, examine yourselves. You who call yourselves Christians, followers of the Lord Jesus, examine yourselves, try yourselves, prove yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates, except you be unapproved. You be found unworthy. You fall into the category of those who are going to say, Lord, Lord, and yet he's going to say, depart from me. Friends, this is a serious matter that deserves much consideration on our part. So let us, as Paul warns us, examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. Well, again, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful that you joined us today. I pray that the Word of God is changing you, transforming you on a daily basis as you spend time in His Holy Word and that you are becoming a faithful practicer of all that you're reading, all that you're learning, so that you can be found by the Lord Jesus as a good and faithful servant. Well, until next time, friends, I truly love you. I pray that your days will be blessed through the Lord Jesus and that you'll continue to strive with great agony to walk in the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Now, as he wills, and until next time, I'll see you on the next video.